Good evening. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing Faith is the Victory. Faith is the Victory. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise. The battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, what raiment shall be given? Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Andrew, for leading us in worship, and thank you, everyone, for being here tonight at East Ham Baptist Church. We are just happy you're here, and I think there's people watching online. Yes, the camera is actually nodding up and down. So thank you, everyone, online for watching us. Now, I'm curious... Did anyone get a video text message from Pastor Green today? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I don't know how I convinced him to do that, to stand here and just stop doing something for 30 seconds and record that video. But I know why, because he really wants you guys to be here, and he really wants you guys to invite people for this Sunday morning for Friend Day. So again, this Sunday morning, Friend Day, 11 o'clock here at the church, 10 a.m. Sunday school, and then after the service, we'll have a barbecue lunch just outside. We'll have the tent set up. Uh, I checked the weather. It's supposed to be beautiful this weekend. We will have bounce houses. We will have games. We'll have all the fun stuff. So invite friends, invite children, invite family. Um, we want this to be an evangelistic meeting, okay? And then next Tuesday, not Thursday, Tuesday, Christian, here it comes. Yeah! <laughs> It was all right. Christian Jose said that was all right. So me, me and Christian will take Jose out back in just a little bit here. But uh, you guys know what this means. It's the Mo Tuesday night. Remember, not Thursday, Tuesday. Tuesday, 615 in the Victory Hall. We'll have Eric Hoven here with us. He's spending the whole week, and I'm actually taking him out to college campuses all week, talking to students, talking to teachers, um, just trying to evangelize and teach people, hey, there is a God in the universe, and we can prove it with science. So pray for that. And then, men, again, 615 this Tuesday, this coming up Tuesday. Uh, we're going to go ahead and receive our offering. Before we do, Brother Newby wants to go over a couple prayer requests. We've had, if you have the prayer sheet, uh, there are some updates on the prayer sheet. We're not going to go through each one of them. Uh, we've had two that's been added, and they're very, uh, very uh, important prayer requests. Uh, Raquel McFarlane and Lucas, they have a baby girl named Neela, and she was born last week and has multiple defects. And uh, it's not, those defects are not compatible with life. And she's on oxygen, and they've brought hospice in. And so uh, just this young newborn, just keep that family and that newborn in prayer. And then our missionary that was with us during the missions conference, Bim uh, Gamir and his wife Charity. Charity is having an appendectomy right now as we're speaking. And so we want to keep Charity in prayer as well. Ushers, if you'll come forward, we're going to go ahead and receive the offering and go to the Lord in prayer for these special requests. Father, we thank you that we have a God that is not bound by time or space. And Father, you know all of these requests even before we mention them, and you know where they're at, uh, anywhere around the world that you can reach. And so, Father, we ask about our prayer list. Father, we thank you for the blessings of answered prayer, but Father, we also know there's a lot of needs on that prayer list that we have that we repeat every week. And uh, Father, I pray that we would use that prayer list to continue in prayer those that are in need. 
Father, we come for these special requests that are here, the, the McFarland baby. Father, you know the, the parents, how difficult of a situation that is, and I pray that you just send the Holy Spirit to comfort their hearts and be with them at this time. Father, we thank you that we have the Holy Spirit there with us in times of stress and trouble. And Father, we pray also for our missionary, Charity, and her husband as she's undergoing surgery right now. Spent out a, a special text to ask all of his churches to pray. And so, Father, tonight we pray for charity help it, that you would guide the surgeon's hands, the, the difficulties that go on there. And, Father, we thank you for those missionaries that have dedicated their life to serving you. And so, Father, we ask for your protection and mercy. Father, be with this offering. Bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you get a double blessing tonight. We have two guests, uh, two, I guess we have more than two guests. We have three guests because your wife's with you. Uh, do you want us to show the video before you come up? After you talk. Well, come on up. Uh, we have uh, Tim and Cindy Lapish. They are missionaries to Fellowship Track Lead, and I'll let him introduce his wife again and tell us a little bit about his ministry, and then we have a video to show. Okay, Go ahead. thank you very much. All right, good evening. I'm Tim Lapish with the Fellowship Track League Ministry out of Cincinnati, Ohio. How many have ever heard of the Fellowship Track League? One, two, three, four, okay, a few. Uh, Fellowship Track League was established in 1978, and before I go on, my wife Cindy, wave at me over here on the right. We have a table in the back with a display of all of our tracks. Now, I'll keep going. I, I'm on a, a, a strict time limit, so I need to get in and get out. I'm going to talk for seven minutes, and we have a video for seven minutes, so I'll start again. I'm with the Fellowship Track League, and we've been traveling for them since 2010. Fellowship Track League is under the Fellowship Baptist Church, Pastor Bill Burroughs in the great Greater Cincinnati, Ohio area. Uh, it was started in 1978, and the founder, Wash Pennington, had a, uh, a vision from God. He felt to print gospel tracts. He wanted to print 100 million tracts. He hadn't even printed one. So that, that's a big leap from one to 100 million. So uh, he started in 1978. I met him in 1979 when Cindy and I went to the historic downtown Central Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio. We were there 30 years, had a Christian school like you and buses everywhere. And we got in at the golden era, the very end of the golden era of the independent Baptist movement when all the churches were full, a great and grand time. Then we met Wash and we started supporting him on a monthly basis for 30 years. Well, in 1978, he printed his first track, and now today we have 5.3 billion gospel tracks printed and handed out free of charge all over the world. As far as I know, nobody has ever challenged me yet on this statement, but it'd be just like Florida for someone to come up and challenge me, but I need to know the truth. As far as I know, the Fellowship Track League ministry is the largest ministry in the history of the world. Again, 5.3 billion gospel tracks 
printed, given away free of charge, including the shipping, to uh, 80 to 90 uh, different languages and countries all over the world. I think we've uh, had 200 different places in the world we sent tracks to, and missionaries that you support are using our tracks. They may not even know it, but when they find out that our tracks are free, including the shipping, they, they don't. <clears throat> excuse me. They don't want a thousand; they want ten thousand. And if originally they wanted ten thousand, now they want a hundred thousand. And once they find out they can get a million, they want a million. And once they get a million, when they find out they can get a sea container of 10 million, that's what they want. So the money's got to come from somewhere. So there's three of us who travel for them, and we raise money for these rolls of paper. Now, this here used to be a roll of paper. Okay, this is the core. We make them into coin banks. And when this giant roll of paper gets rolled off, it prints 125,000 tracks. And when these go to, say, India, because there's so many people and so little reading material, every track is read at least eight different times. And I think it's far more than that. So a roll of paper now costs $250. On the video, it's going to say $350 to $400. But the price has gone down since this video was made. So for $250, $150, think about reaching 1 million people with the gospel. And, and so a lot of money has come in. A lot of churches got behind it. We had actually two churches two years ago, each bought 100 rolls of paper in one service. One was in Orlando. One was in Tampa. And when I told the church in Tampa about what the church in Orlando did, they decided to match it. So 200 rolls of paper came in. You can do the math on how much money that was. And I couldn't figure out why so many uh, people bought paper that, that uh, particular day, because that had never happened before. Well, two weeks later, the war between Russia and Ukraine broke out, and the track league was low on paper and low on finances, and missionaries and, and Baptist preachers in Russia, Ukraine, and all the bordering countries in NATO called the track league to get tracks free in the language of their people they were ministering to, because they all felt like Putin was going to come right through Ukraine and wipe all them out. So the Lord prepared with those two churches for 200 rolls of paper, and it's just great to see what the Lord does in the hearts and minds of churches, individuals, businesses, uh, you name it, we have money coming in from all sources. So uh, we've been coming down to Florida since 2015. We stay in Orlando, Kissimmee, and we go out to all the major cities and churches, and uh, Pastor Green was nice enough to have us in. We had seen him at Lake Zurich last summer when he went up there to present a ministry on church planning and keeping up uh, struggling churches open, so uh, it just worked out perfect tonight. So we, we turned these cores into coin banks. We have uh, left over 2,600 coin banks. Uh, the church that took the largest amount of coin banks was in Jacksonville. In one service, they ended up ordering 50 of these coin banks, so we ship them to the churches when they order them. And, and you know, I thought at first, well, this is just kid stuff. Why would I be doing that? I mean, that, that's all there is in there. But you know what? Almost more money comes in through coin banks than anything else. Else. And it's just amazing. One little girl in Indiana went all Sunday afternoon uh, with this coin bank, and she got it completely filled with change, bills, and checks. And another boy, not to be outdone in Ohio, heard about that. He cut grass all summer and gave everything he had to fill up the coin bank, and he did the same. One church actually weighed the amount of change that they collected, and it was almost 600 pounds of change. They had five-gallon buckets all the way across to the front of the auditorium. The pastor brought his scales from home. I'm not so sure how accurate those scales would have been. But anyway, 600 pounds of change, dozens and dozens of five-gallon buckets, thousands and thousands of dollars came in from children who were being taught about missions and missionaries. So it's a wonderful ministry. It's a silent ministry. We are the beginning point of that supply line that leads to the foreign field at your missionaries that you support get free of charge. So we go into churches, so we're asking the church tonight if they could buy a roll of paper, maybe an individual, and I don't want to say too much without the pastor present, but that's what we do. And uh, we had one church in West Virginia that had me in at the last second. I didn't have a 
p.m. service, and so I didn't know what to expect. And after the service, the pastor says, well, we're not going to do anything for the track league tonight because this was kind of a last-minute meeting. Brother Lapish called us. So he said, we're having the business meeting Wednesday. That Wednesday, he texted me, and they decided to write a check to the Fellowship Track League for $10,000. So I, I don't care how long you folks think about it. I, I just pray that the Holy Spirit really does the job in your heart. A second request I have tonight, uh, will we sign down with the Fellowship Track League. They don't pay us a salary. We travel at our own expense. We have to raise our own support. So if the church maybe is taking on a new missionary this year, or if a missionary is coming off the field, you need to replace him. Think about Cindy and I. Uh, we've been traveling for this uh, number of years, 14, 15 years, at our own nickel, and it does get expensive. And as long as we have people willing to support us, we're willing to keep on traveling. So that that's it in a nutshell. You want to hear more about it, see me afterwards there. Uh, we do have coin banks. Uh, if you want one, we'll, we'll take up a list and send them to the church. And we do have prayer uh, cards here. And we have a work day every Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. We want to invite you to come up there and, and fill out orders for millions of tracks. You said, well, why would I drive all that way? That's what a church in Jacksonville said uh, about eight years ago. Two years later, they came up. A church in Supply, North Carolina, kind of laughed, and I invited them to come up. And their secretary emailed me a couple years later. They had rented out a Greyhound bus, and they were filling it with adults to come up for the track league. So if you do come up, we have the Ark, the creation. Museum, Bearing Precious Sea, the Prince of our King James Bible, a couple exits away. There's a lot to do in southwest Ohio. We would love to have you come. Thank you so much. My name is Alexis Givens. I was born in Costa Rica. I'm a result of the way God uses the gospel track. One day while I was... Uh, traveling uh, I needed to read something so in my house I just take a piece of paper was, was laying right there I start reading this piece of paper and it start sharing what Christ had done on the cross for me and for the first time in my life I was exposed to the gospel I'm from Papua New Guinea Somebody give me a gospel track. And the gospel track that I read, it strikes me. And it makes a lot of sense. Although I read the Bible and I go to church and I'm a religious person, but what I read from the gospel track makes a lot of sense because the gospel tracks become, have become a very important medium in which we communicate the gospel to the lost world. Hello, I'm Pastor William Burroughs. I pastored the Fellowship Baptist Church in Lebanon, Ohio, the home of the Fellowship Track League. In 1978, Walsh Pennington felt led of the Lord to begin the Fellowship Track League, and the church was totally behind him. And with great excitement and a lot of hard work, the Fellowship Track League was born. And since its inception, it became clear that the Track League was the proper title because there's no way we could have printed over 5 billion gospel tracks without other brothers and sisters in Christ of like-minded faith helping us along the way. And I want to thank all of you who have really given up your time and your labor and, and your finances to help us and really come alongside us and partner with us to accomplish what we've accomplished. In 1989, we got our first two-color press that allowed printing of gospel tracts off of a roll of paper instead of the sheet bed. This allowed for more production as well as becoming more cost-effective and efficient in getting the gospel out. In 2018, we added our newest edition, which allowed for us to have two full-color presses remaining on the rolls of paper. One roll of paper will print 125,000 tracks and currently costs around $350 to $400. We order a truckload of paper every month, and that is 84 rolls of paper. While this seems like a lot of money, it breaks down to be one penny will produce the paper for three to four gospel tracts. It is quite an efficient way to get the gospel out. My wife and I were introduced to the Fellowship Track League in 1982 when we went to Canada School Missions Institute of Maranatha Baptist Mission in Mississippi. We were introduced to the ministry by Brother Milton Martin, a longtime missionary in Central America. He taught us classes on using literature on the mission field. 
and he handed out a little tiny thin sample pack, everything they had, and said, and here's the pledge to get your gospel tracts, Fellowship Track League. And they provided tracts for us here in the ministry, and we use weekly out when we're soul winning, and just when we're out and about in our daily lives. Most of our tracts, if not all, most of our tracts come from Fellowship Track League. With that additional impact we're going to have now with the 400,000 gospel tracts, that's going to that's going to, that's going to, again, make inroads. We began ordering from them, got to visit the ministry, while on deputation. When we left for the mission field, when we came to Grenada, they gave us more gospel tracts than there were people on the island. The mission statement of Fellowship Track League has always been, all tracts free as the Lord provides. This has allowed us to ship and print over 5 billion gospel tracts in over 85 different languages. One of the ways that we ship out tracks is in a 20-foot sea container, which will hold up to 10.5 million gospel tracks. But we don't ship out only large amounts of tracks like that. We will ship out an order as low as one track to tens of thousands of tracks. We get on average 600 orders a week at the Fellowship Track League. We also have 12 mail centers that partner with us and helping provide the manpower and cost needed to provide the shipping of these gospel tracts. We have four international mail centers as well that help send out tracts at a more cost-effective rate in their countries. And this has been a tremendous blessing to the Fellowship Track League. Gospel tracts, soul winning, still work like it always has. Seed can't grow in the barn. You have to get the gospel tracts out and into the hands of the lost. And the pastors here doing that, Fellowship Track League's provided again more full color gospel tracts than there are people on the island. A lady asked me for tracts. She said, Pastor Mike, we go soul winning in our area, but we don't have any tracts. So sometimes when we go, we speak to people, we don't have the Bible to give them, and we don't have no literature to live with them. Now, I said to her, we've got 400,000 tracts that are just coming in and we've put the tools in their hands. We've given them the seed, we've given them the Bibles, and they're now starting to go out. They're going into the schools. They're going into the villages and trying to reach their own people with the gospel. And it still works. You may be wondering how you can help the Fellowship Track League. First, we ask that you pray for us. Pray for our workers. Pray that God keeps them safe. Please pray for our financial needs as well and the cost of running a ministry. Please consider coming out and seeing us as well. We invite you to come out and partner with us on a Tuesday. We have a volunteer work day from 9 to noon, and then we provide a free lunch. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. And let's continue to make the Great Commission part of our daily commitment. The same way God used that gospel track, He's still using it to bring salvation to many people. Knowing that you have given them the word of God in the written literature and sure enough the word of God will not come back in vain Amen, thank you so much Go ahead and stand once more as we sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is greater than all our sin marvelous infinite matchless grace freely bestowed on all who face. Will you this moment his 
Grace, grace, receive. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Wonderful singing. You may be seated. Well, I don't know if Brother Halfley has ever been called the second blessing or not, but Brother Halfley, come ahead. Uh, we had an opportunity to have him uh, be with the staff this morning and, and uh, uh, take us through this morning and this afternoon some training sessions to help us with uh, an area in which uh, we can help and comfort those going through difficult times. And we just really appreciate him for what he did and the information that he gave us. And we left with certification to do certain things. And so, Brother Halfley, just come ahead and preach to us if you would. Thank you so appreciate much. Appreciate it. So an honor to be here tonight. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to preach. God bless you from the, the Fellowship Track League. What a blessing that is. I've known about you guys for years, but no Brother Burroughs. I've known him for years and uh, use your tracks a lot. Praise the Lord for what God's doing there. Um, I want you to turn in your Bibles if you would. If you've got your Bibles with you tonight, I'd like you to turn into Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Let me ask you a question real quick just to find out who I've got here in this service. Um, is there anybody here that's ever been tempted by the devil? Uh, let, me see. <laughs> let me see your hands. Anybody? Okay, so uh, if you weren't tempted by the devil, are you alive? Are you dead? Are you here? Uh, seriously, he, he kind of gives us a run for our money some days, doesn't he? Has he ever given you trouble? I'm telling you what, he throws everything he can throw at us. He, I don't know if you noticed, but he doesn't like us much. Everything he says, everything he does is really to trip us up and cause us trouble. He tells us that uh, there's beautiful things out there and then we look underneath the beautiful things that he has and there's hooks and problems and addictions and all kinds of things. He drags us through all kinds of trouble. Well, what I want to talk to you about tonight is um, how, to, how to beat him at his game. Okay? We're going to use, we're going to use Jesus' example in the wilderness, okay? So Jesus goes into the wilderness, and he fasts and prays there in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. And the Bible says the devil comes to him when he's starving, he's hungry, and the Bible tells us that he is tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, we know he's the son of God. In him is light. There's no, in him is no darkness at all. He's all light. And there's no, no bad, no evil. And of course, we have that to contend with. But he, he laid out a pathway for us. He wanted to show us how we could defeat Satan. And so I'm going to give you three things tonight. We're going to talk about defeating the lust of the flesh, defeating the pride of life, and defeating the lust of the eyes. Those are the three things Jesus combated and he showed us a pathway how to beat that. Let's read in Matthew chapter 4 beginning with verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit of the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him he said if thou be the son of God command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest in any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of men. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. Ho, ho, isn't that great? Uh, he won, didn't he? Don't you like those moments when the devil leaveth thee? Huh? 
And that's what happened here. The devil le- left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Let's bow and ask God to bless his word tonight in the next few minutes. Father, we thank you so much for this privilege to speak here to this uh, wonderful church. God, thank you for all these people that have come out on a Wednesday night. They come here expecting to hear from you. God, if they just came, if they, all they leave here uh, is hearing my voice and hearing what I, my thoughts are, Lord, this is a waste of time. I pray, God, that you would reach through my soul and pour out to them the thoughts and words and answers that they need for their heart. God, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that does not know you as their personal Savior, I I pray that tonight they'd make that decision plain and clear. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in this passage, we're told that Jesus was led on purpose through the wilderness. On purpose. I don't know about you, but sometimes the wilderness experience feels a little bit constricting. I mean, there there might have been a time or two when I've complained about it. Anybody else? Anybody here ever complained about what you were going through? Boy, we, we look at, um, we look at those, the, the, the troubles and the difficulties of life and we're like, wow, why am I doing that? Well, Jesus could have opted out of that. I mean, honestly, think about it. He was born in a stable, right? He was born to a carpenter. I mean, Moses... Went, was in Pharaoh's house, got to learn all the things. Daniel was captive, and he ended up in a king's palace. I mean, these guys had opportunities, had money, had everything provided for them, but not Jesus. He grew up with a carpenter, building Roman crosses for crucifixion, probably. You ever think about that? Doing all kinds of things like that with his hands. B- grew up in a, in a place where it was... It was considered a dark place. It was considered um, not a, a, you know, could anything good come out of Galilee? It was, uh, there was, uh, not a, it was not a good city, a good town to live in. He didn't have all of the pedigree that some of us would have. He didn't live in Orlando, get to go to Disneyland, whatever he wanted to. How many of you guys in here have never been to Disneyland? Uh, and you live here, right? Yeah. So uh, that's typical, isn't it? It's like, oh, I'll get there one day, but I don't know when, you know. Okay. <laughs> uh, so he didn't have any opportunities like that to go to the, see the sites or anything like that, right? He was in Galilee. Why did he choose? Why did he choose? Why did he allow himself to go through this difficult time in his life? Why did he on purpose go through the wilderness experience? He went through it on purpose to show us how to win. Let's look at what he did. The first thing we find is in verse 4. Of course, the tempter comes and says, If you're the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. And Jesus says in verse 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is what we're talking about here. We're talking about the lust of the flesh. The appetites of the flesh. Look, I'm hungry. That's what I want. You know, that's what what addictions are. Addictions are, that's what I want. I'm hungry. Give me what'll take care of my appetite. Right? How How do we beat that? The devil knows our weaknesses. He comes along and he says, ah, but that tastes so good. Remember when Eve is in the Garden of Eden, she's standing there looking at the tree. And the devil says, ah, see how good it is. See how pretty it is. Oh, it's going to taste wonderful. Once you eat it, you know what? Your eyes are going to be open. You're going to know things you never knew before. Wow. Lust of the flesh. You see, um, before we get too hard on Adam and Eve. Let's think about the things that we consume. Can I say to you that if you want to beat the devil at this game, the key, are you ready for this? Is to control what you consume. I mean, if you, want to, if you take notes, you want to write that down, you write it down. 
if you don't want to write it down, just stick it in your head. Control. Think about it. Control what you consume. Say that with me. Say it with me. Control what you consume. You must control what you consume. Say it again. Control what you consume. You see, what you're taking into your body is what affects your mind, your heart, everything. You see, before Jesus came into the garden, and this is, I mean, before in the wilderness, the thing that he did, notice in verse um, 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Before the devil came and tempted him with bread, he already decided what he was going to take in. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that cometh out of the mouth of God. He said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put that stuff in. Listen, listen. In our culture, one of the biggest problems we have is what we consume. Can you say amen right there? Amen. Look, if you're, if you're uh, talking about what's on uh, this thing right here, right? How, much, how many time do we spend on that? What are we doing? We're consuming something, right? So you, you say, well, man... How come, how come God's not close to me? How come, how come, did you find him on Facebook? Uh, well, how come I'm not hearing anything from the Lord? Huh? That's because you didn't, you didn't look up his Snapchat and see what he was snapping to you. Huh? TikTok. We're not, it's not TikTok in Jesus' time, Right? So what you're consuming, what most people do, they walk around, and, and I'm not preaching against a cell phone, I'm just telling you, or getting on there and looking at things, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm just telling you what you're doing is you're consuming things that aren't godly, that aren't righteous, and you're wondering why there's no God anywhere around you. Amen. See, Jesus established in his own mind and heart before he came in contact with old Scratch himself. What he decided to do was control what he consumed. Say that again. Control what you consume. Think about that. Um, do you know fasting? Fasting is something that's not done much. If you go to Matthew chapter 17, I want to show you something here. Matthew 17 and... Uh, we're going to look at one verse. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, I know you guys use the King James Bible here. I do use the King James Bible. This verse I'm going to read you is not in the English Standard Version. It's not in the NIV either. It's in the King James Bible. And they took it out in these other versions. It's, uh, it's, it's a key to unlocking the, the, the fight against addiction. Okay? Okay. Um, so what happens is Jesus is transfigured, Matthew 17, and he comes, he's up on the mountain, he's praying, he's talking to God, and they're talking about the kingdom and all this kind of stuff. And then he comes down off the mountain and he sees this boy, this boy's in trouble. He's demon-possessed, his kid's demon-possessed, all right? And the disciples cannot cast the demons out of him. So they look, and Jesus comes down and he takes care of it just like that. And the disciples look at him and they say, well, how come we can't get rid of this thing? How come we can't get rid of these demons? What's wrong? What's the matter with us? And Jesus said in verse 21, you ready? I underlined it in my Bible, marked it, highlighted it. How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This kind of demonic activity, only you can only get rid of it through prayer and fasting. Do you know what? I'm, uh, I'm not going to bash any of the um, addictions programs. I love the addictions programs and things that, that are out there. I have not found them to be successful in my area. We have a lot of, a, a lot of drugs as, as in most, most areas, most communities. And uh, most of the time I found the people that, that have the most trouble do not come to the drug addiction programs. So I began searching for the answer to that. God, what can we do? How can we break the chains of addiction? And he said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And we started a campaign when someone comes to our church and they're struggling with some kind of addiction, whatever it is, we started a campaign to fast and pray for them and encourage them to do the same. Why? What are we doing? Controlling what we consume. Do you know what? 
Those people that have fasted and prayed together with us, do you know what's happened? Chains of addiction fall off just like that. He's a chain breaker, right? Oh, we preach that he's a chain breaker. Why are our churches so full of people who are still in chains? Why? Because they're not controlling what they consume. Are you getting the point? See, that fasting, that battle, that fight with the devil is won long before the battle. It's when you decide, I'm going to not let the flesh control me. I'm going to control the flesh. That's fight number one. Can I say to you, flee the flesh? That's what the Bible says. That's how you're supposed to fight it. Flee it. Um, in, uh, In Romans chapter 13, he says in verse 14, let me read that verse to you real quick. Romans 13, verse 14. Wow. It's very clear. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In other words, starve it. Don't give the flesh what it wants. Control what you consume. The second thing I noticed Jesus is is fighting against the devil. It says in verse 6 of Matthew 4, He saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written, again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What's going on here? The devil is saying to him, Look, your life is valuable. You're only 30 years old. Come on. Why would you throw away your life for people that don't even care? People that are going to criticize you, mock you, malign you. Why, why, are you, why are you doing this? You could have anything you want. Listen, just worship me. Just worship me. Look, if, if, if you want this kingdom, I'll give it to you. If you want um, this thing in the world, I'll give it to you. I own the world. Let me give it to you. How did Jesus fight that? I want to tell you. This is a, this is a, uh, it's addictive. Power in the world is addictive. Uh, politics. Uh, I got involved in politics when I was younger. And I'm going to tell you something. I, it didn't take me long at all to realize it was a siren song. The power is addictive. You get around people, they know who you are. And the, the Bible says even the, even the Pharisees in the, in the New Testament, they love to be known in the street corners. Everybody knows who I am. Right? It's addictive. The devil looks at you and says, look, this dude, I want you to do, I'll give you all this stuff. I'll give you the power, I'll give you the prestige, I'll give you the position. Huh. Why do we spend so much on all the stuff we spend our money on? The clothes the vehicles, the homes. Because <laughs> we got to look good, right? Huh? Oh, everything the devil wants, to, everything the world has to offer, we want that because we want to be influen- influencers. We want to be influential is what we used to say. When the devil comes along, understand that what Adam was supposed to do in the garden, he was supposed to stand up to the serpent. He was supposed to say, stay out of the garden. Stand up to him. But Adam didn't do a thing. When the devil come along and said, hey, I think I'd like to hang out under this tree. Adam never mentioned anything. Didn't say anything. Listen to me. One of the biggest problems Christians have in our culture in America today is they won't stand up against the serpent. You won't, oh, you won't open your mouth. Oh, but if I say anything, I'll lose my job. Uh, tell Jesus that. Amen. Jesus, I understand. I appreciate all that you did for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Oh, thank you for bleeding and all that kind of stuff. But you got to understand, if I lose my job, I can't pay for my cell phone. We don't, we don't stand up at all. In the, in the schools, the public schools, we just... We just roll over and play dead. They come in and say, say stuff. They give garbage to our children. And we just stand there and say, mm, well, you know. 
the workplace, they start doing things, saying things. And we're like, you know, I'm just going to be quiet. I'm just going to show them my faith. Hmm? Here's the thing. In James chapter 4, the Bible says this. Resist the devil, and he will do what? He'll flee from you. The problem, the reason he's not fleeing, is you gave him a sofa in your house. The reason he's not fleeing is you're not telling him he's doing anything wrong. You're not speaking up to him. Do you know what our children need in our culture? They need a guide. They need somebody to say, no, this is not cool. No, that is not the way things are. No. No. No is an operative word. And we let the devil come in and whisper to them and we just say, well, you know, I'm going to let my kids grow up and figure out for themselves. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that it's possible for Christians to give a place to the devil. Are you ready for this? Ephesians 4, verse 26. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Deception is a tricky thing. You can give him a spot in your life. You know that, right? You can give him a place. You can give him a place that makes him comfortable. He feels good there. When uh, um, the maniac of Gadara, remember the story about the maniac of Gadara, Mark chapter 5, I think it is? Do you guys remember the story? So what happened is Jesus is looking at this maniac and he says, he says um, you know, what's your name? And they said, well, we're legion for we are many. And Jesus said, um, you know, he talked to them a little bit and they said, please, we know you're going to cast this out, but don't cast this out of the country. We like this country. We want to stay here. Do you know there are places I've noticed, Brother Rockwell, I've noticed there are places the devil likes to hang out. You'll you find him down at the bar. you find him on the internet. You'll find, him, you'll find him in places, sometimes at the schoolhouse. If, if he feels comfortable, he'll hang out there. Funny thing is, the devil's darkness, and if you flip on the light, the darkness isn't there anymore. He doesn't have any, any way to fight back. It's just boom. He's gone. That's what the Lord's telling you to do. Stand up against the serpent. Jesus looked at the devil and He said this. Don't tempt me. Basically, shut up. Right? Is it, is it okay to say that? I grew up in the country. We said a lot of things. Some days I don't know whether I'm, I can say those things or not. You know... Um, Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says, Stand therefore, having the loins girt about with truth. Stand, stand, stand. Do you know that one of the best things you could do to the devil is tell him, No, I don't want you here. Get out of my life. You could say, No, I'm not giving you a place in my home. No, I'm not going to be... Uh, I'm, and what's interesting in Ephesians 4, he says you can give him a place by not being forgiving. forgiving. You know, that bitterness will get in your heart. He said, be angry and sin not. Get that bitterness in your heart towards somebody, right? And it stays there and you're angry and angrier and angry. You get all mad and upset. The devil's like, ha, 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 ha. That's some good ground for me. He's discouraged. He's down. I'll just put this thing over here and he'll go this way or that way or another way. He's really, really slick. Listen. The second thing Jesus did was stand up to the serpent. Can you say that? Stand up to the serpent. Can, I, can you say it really loud? Stand up. Say it. Say it really loud. Stand up to the serpent. Say it again. Stand up to the serpent. That's what you need to do. Stand up to him. Tell him no. Next time he comes along and talks to you in your ear, tell him no. See what happens. The third thing is in verse 10. 
The devil says in verse 9, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, First John says there are three problems that we have. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This right here is talking about the lust of the eyes. Now, I'm going to tell you, whenever somebody starts talking about the lust of the eyes, you know where we're going to go, right? Huh. No, we're not. You see... Where everyone goes is a symptom, not the cause. Okay, let me just say this. If you have a porn addiction, that's the symptom of a problem. That's not the cause. Let's go to the root of the problem. Lust of the eyes. In Genesis chapter 3, what happened? The Bible says that Eve looks at the tree and she sees in the tree something good for it. She sees, wow, it's good for it. What's she doing? She's looking at it, right? She's seeing it, right? Right? Eve saw. But what did she see? She saw that it would make her, are you ready for this? A God. What happened is that she began to worship the creature more than the creator. Worshiping the creature leaves no room for the creator. Go to Romans chapter 1. Look at me, I'm, I'm about done here. Give me just a few more minutes. Romans chapter 1, you guys know about this, right? So, so, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has showed it unto them. For verse 20, For the invisible things uh, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everyone knows. Every person in the world knows. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you know in your heart there's something wrong. Everyone knows. You're made that way. So, well, what if I'm a Buddhist? doesn't matter. Same God made everybody. Amen. Professing themselves to be wise. Uh, what, what, verse 21, I'm sorry. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory, you ready this? The glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. What was the problem here? They were worshiping the creature more than the creator. Wherefore, verse 24, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Ooh. Ooh. That's, that's, that's right out there, isn't it? That's, that's really not popular to talk about, is it? Hmm. And even as they, here's the problem, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't want to think about God. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So we're made this way, we can't help it. You made a choice and then God said, okay, go ahead. I want to tell you something. Verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them on Netflix. I mean uh, that do them. Right? See that? Knowing the judgment of God. Christians, we're spending our life, our entertainment hours. Where's God? Where are you, you're Control what you consume. You're watching all this garbage and you're starting to get used to it. Hmm? It's true, isn't it? 
What's going on here? What's wrong? Well, this third way, or third thing to fight, the third thing to, 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 to win with, the third tool, as it were, to win with, is simply this. Start worshiping God. Why? Listen, why do we come on Sunday morning? Why do we come on Sunday? So listen, you come on Sunday morning, and you sit in your pew, and, well, we sing songs, and you're thinking about what you're going to eat for Sunday dinner. I hope the preacher gets us out in time to make it before the Pentecostals at the, at the cafeteria line. I hope Arby's is serving the McRib today. Huh? Boy, I hope he gets us out. And we're sitting here thinking about all kinds of things in church, right? You know what you need to do? You need to come to church. And you need to, you need to get in the church. Listen, listen. Are you, are you hearing this? You need to come to church. And you need to think about God. Amen. You need to look up. You need to walk in the room. Oh, wow. Sister so-and-so over there. She thinks she's something. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh. Not Pastor Ron again. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Really? The preacher's going to let Todd get up there and play around? <laughs> Seriously? Come on. Why don't we put him down in the youth department? Let him talk to them. Huh? You know what? You're supposed to be doing walking and looking for God. When you hear the preaching, when you hear the message, you're supposed to open your heart and hear God's voice. So, well, I don't like the way the preacher said that. Well, you're listening to the wrong person. You're listening to the preacher. You're supposed to be trying to hear what God's telling you. Tonight, I've been here trying to do my best to give you what God wants you to hear. Okay? Are you hearing His voice? That's what matters. I want you to remember the message. Sure, I hope you remember me. Maybe you won't. Ron can't even pronounce my name right. I mean, it's like, it's like calling a flea. Hey, flea. Not halfly. Uh, hey, flea. I'm just messing with you, man. So, um, seriously, I, I hope you remember me. I hope you think about the guy that climbed up on the pew. Huh? I hope... But you know, that's not why you came tonight. That's right. You came to hear the voice of God. Right? right? And you're hope, I'm hoping that more than anything, you heard Him. And if you come to church looking for God, looking to worship Him, you're going to find Him. Second Chronicles 7.14 said, My people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And look, look at this. Seek my face. What does God want you to do? He wants you to look for Him. You can see Him in the face of a baby. You can see Him in the flowers on the road. You can see Him in the, the songs of the birds. You can hear Him in the, in the uh, amazing skill of the musicians. You can hear His voice in everything if you look for it. Amen. Worship God. Amen. Sunday morning when you come to church, look up. Look at him. Forget everything else. Say, God, I want to find you today. I want to meet you today. When you get your devotions, don't say, oh, I've got to read 10 pages today. Then I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And Stop and worship God. Because here's the problem in our culture today. We're worshiping man. Even in the pulpits, Brother Todd, we're talking about the preacher that's the greatest. Or we're talking about the group or the church or the whatever it is. Oh, this is the greatest church. Or this is the greatest pastor. Or, this is the greatest whatever, whatever. It's not the people we're supposed to be worshiping. It's God. And when you start worshiping people, the creature, the devil's going to get in there and say, <laughs> gotcha. I don't care how spirit-filled that pastor is. If you worship the man, you're going to be disappointed. Hmm? You're going to fall flat on your face. These are, the, these are the ways to fight the devil. And I'm going to tell you something. They're tried and true. Jesus used them, and he said, this is the way to do it. I was tempted in all points, such as you are, and here's how you win. I hope, I hope God helped you tonight. Brother. Brother Hayfley thought he was special. I mispronounce everybody's name. All right.
right, well, we're going to ask our ushers to get together. We're going to receive an offering for our speakers tonight and, and uh, just uh, give liberally as you can and uh, just uh, help as it defrays the cost of uh, the many different things that they do. So we appreciate the faithfulness of God's people. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our speakers tonight. Father, we thank you for the word of God that's been given to us. And Father, as we prepare our hearts to be in the house of God every service, help us to be ready to receive what you have for us. Father, thank you for these people that have dedicated their lives to service to you. Father, I pray that you would be with them, keep them safe as they travel. And Father, help us to be a blessing to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We sing our closing song. I just want to make a couple announcements. Missionaries are going to be right in the back, so make sure you greet them and uh, give them a welcome. Uh, also, this Sunday morning is Friend Day, huge day for our church. We haven't had it in a few years. Make sure you're here. Make sure you're inviting friends. I've been calling some people this afternoon, trying to get as many people here as possible. Uh, that'll be this Sunday morning at 11 a.m. There'll be lunch afterwards, some different activities for the kids. Uh, so make sure you put that in your calendar. Make sure you are here this Sunday at 11 a.m. Let's go ahead and close in singing. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthem ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Amen. You are dismissed.